Thanks, Jemima, and thanks to the Hinks. I'm actually seriously tempted to say nothing and just let it stand as it's been read and everything we've heard so far with the, the Lord's My Shepherd, that amazing Psalm 23 that we've sung about as well. Um, and that's that thought, I trust in him alone. And then that final verse of Romans 16, um, well, from verse 25 onwards, to him who is able to establish you, to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ, amen. I'm, I, I am seriously tempted just to stop there and let everything that we've heard so far stand and let us mull it over and reflect on it. Um, but I've kind of been asked to do, to say something, so I probably should, and then, but please don't lose all that you've heard so far this morning. Um, there's issues of food security in Kenya as well. So I will do what I've been asked to do. I will faithfully try to um, spend a few minutes saying some things, but please don't let it distract from the reading of God's word in Psalm 23 and Romans 15, 16, and the other things that we've been thinking about in song and in prayer. Thanks, Jemima, for leading us so well. <clears throat> On the 24th of August, so just under two weeks ago, Pastor Erin Hitchens, who was 46, of West Palm Beach, Florida, died of COVID-19. Her husband, Brian, who's also a pastor, now wishes that they hadn't believed and promoted conspiracy theories about COVID-19, and he wishes that they'd followed the advice of people who really knew what they were talking about. Sadly, they're not the only ones who, who think they know better. In this social media age, we all seem to think we're experts. One person who really does know some things is Kristalina Georgieva, the Chief Executive Officer of the International Monetary Fund. In a fascinating TED interview, What We Learn from the Crisis, which was published on the 28th of May this year, and you can find it on any, anywhere, wherever you, you get your podcasts, she shares all sorts of interesting observations. One of them is this, Investing in people is the very best investment we can make. The Apostle Paul would have approved. The last chapter of Romans, as we've seen from the reading, is deeply personal with lots of rich information about various people in whom Paul had invested and whom he clearly loves. You, you almost wonder why this deeply personal part of the letter needs to be part of God's word until you remind yourself that a lot of the Bible is about people and God's love for people, and that God's word is made up of all sorts of different types of literature, including letters that carry the full authority of the apostles of Jesus in the narrower sense than is used in, in 16 verse seven. So for example, in 2 Peter 3 verses 15 to 16, Peter writes this, bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God has given him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking of them in these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. Be encouraged by that, by the way. If Peter found it difficult to understand some of Paul's writings, don't be too surprised if you and I do. His, his letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures, writes Peter to their own destruction. So these letters of Paul, writing as an apostle of Jesus in the narrower sense, are part of the scriptures of God, and therefore to be noted with huge interest, with massive um, authority in our lives. Several things are noteworthy here about Paul's friendships. For a start, it's noteworthy how many of them are women possibly some of them single, though some are clearly married. And it's striking that some are Jews and some are Gentiles. Paul crossed barriers for Jesus, barriers of gender, of race, and of culture. And that takes us neatly back to chapter 15, and perhaps especially to verses 20 and 21, where we read, it's always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Rather, as it is written, those who are not told about him will see and those who have not heard will understand. 
This is why he goes on to say to the Romans, I've often been hindered from coming to you. So Paul crossed barriers for Jesus. And that leads us to the question, what is our part in global mission? Paul obviously had unique roles to, pl to play in the spread of the good news about Jesus and the resurrection in the first century in the Roman Empire as an apostle in the narrower sense. As he writes in verse 15 of chapter 15, I've written to you quite boldly on some points as if to remind you of them again because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the, to the Gentiles with the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. He had a unique, special role to play in the first century, fully proclaiming the gospel of Christ, verse 19 of chapter 15, and preaching the gospel where Christ was not known, verse 20 of chapter 15. He was clearly a pioneer, and in that, pi in that pioneering, he models for all of us what it means to be a representative of Jesus in our home cultures and beyond. Notice how his understanding of the gospel the good news about Jesus and the resurrection was very rounded. It was very material as, very, as well as very spiritual. He cared about poverty and social welfare. That's obvious in his commitment to carrying funds to Jerusalem. That's what verses 25 and 26 of, of chapter 15 are about. For the carrying funds to Jerusalem for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. And his mention of remembering the poor in Galatians 2 verse 10 is another reminder that he cared deeply about poverty and social welfare. And then reading his various comments about individuals in chapter 16, thank you again, Hing's family, for doing all those readings and for those difficult names. His comments suggest that his understanding of the gospel would have included mental, emotional and social well-being as well. So although Paul had a special role to play in the first century, the understanding that underpinned that role is deeply relevant for all of us because the task of getting the rounded gospel out to the whole world is far from finished. And we all have a part to play in doing that in the 21st century. The good news about Jesus and the resurrection has now gone to many parts of the world, far more than Paul could ever have imagined. But there are still lots of people groups and lots of places that it hasn't reached. And there are lots of sectors of society that it hasn't penetrated. The reality is that there are lots of parts of the world where there's far less gospel impact than there, than there is in the United Kingdom. And that the United Kingdom has been privileged to enjoy over many centuries. However frustrated you get about how, how few people seem to really know Jesus in 21st century Britain, the UK situation is a lot more privileged than many, many other parts of the world. Firstly, there are lots of parts of the world in which most people will never meet a committed Christian. For example, many, peace, many parts of the Middle East and North Africa, lots of parts of, parts of South Asia and East Asia, in the Middle East and North Africa, the region has been hemorrhaging Christians. Sadly, large numbers of Christians have been driven out in different ways and for different reasons in recent decades. So actually, it's becoming more and more unlikely that you would meet a committed Christian in many, many parts of the Middle East and North Africa. Then there are other parts of the world in which there are far more Christians than there are in the UK. For example, lots of sub-Saharan Africa and most of Latin America, but where the gospel has had very, very little impact on society. Needs are overwhelming, as we heard from Joe Bonga in the video, particularly now. But then even before COVID-19, which has exacerbated everything, there's war and conflict, high levels of injustice, uncontrolled corruption, unchecked abuses of power, lack of protection in law for the most vulnerable. So we need to remind ourselves that of, of that simple fact that drove Paul again and again, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God so loved the world. That includes Wheatley, thank God, and the whole of the UK, but it's far from limited to weekly 
and the rest of the UK. Paul was desperate to get to other parts of the world to share the good news of Jesus and the resurrection. And that's a reminder that the gospel didn't originate with the pagan tribes of Northern Europe who received the good news after Paul's life. And a reminder that we have no right to think that we deserve to be specially privileged in some way. Rather, we should be generously passing on the blessings we have received. Just as the churches in Macedonia and Ikea understood that they should be generous towards Jewish followers of Jesus, so churches in Ox Oxfordshire should be generous not only with material blessings, but also with the good news of Jesus and the resurrection to a world in need. And so we come in some ways full circle to the beginning of Romans and to much, much earlier in the Bible to a reminder from Genesis chapter 12 and verses one to three, where the Lord had said this to Abraham, go from your country, your people and your father's households to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. We've been reminded through this book of Romans that all of us who are followers of Jesus, Jew or Gentile, privileged to grow up in a, with a Jewish background or grafted in as Gentiles afterwards, that we are now the children of Abraham. We are now those entrusted with the good news through whom all peoples on earth should be blessed. As children of Abraham, we are called to be a blessing to the nations, beginning where we are, but not ending there. That will mean some of us moving to other parts of the world for Jesus, because that's a sacrifice that needs to be made for the sake of a needy world and for the glory of God. And the possibility of making that sacrifice is one which shouldn't be dismissed too quickly, given the massive needs of the world. As, as Al put it last week, love is measured in sacrifice. And Jesus tells us, whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life will preserve it. Luke 17. For others of us, it will mean befriending international students right here, or becoming involved with refugees locally. Cyril Newton can tell you more about how to do that. Or working hard to understand what makes other British ethnicities tick. And for all of us, it will mean praying for the world. You notice that, that deep, personal connection that Paul had with so many people as recorded in Romans 16. My guess is that that's because he prayed for them. And we should be praying, perhaps praying as we watch the news, actually certainly praying as we watch the news, perhaps joining the monthly WCC mission prayer meeting or using the new monthly WCC mission prayer sheet the September sheet was in this week's WCC email news, or getting Claire Suleiman's prayer letter, or asking Aget about the realities on the ground in Syria and northern Iraq, or asking any one of the individuals who've received fun, funds from the COVID-19 hardship fund to let you know about their situation and their part of the world and how you can pray for them. Talking of that fund, being a blessing to the nations also means giving. That's a part of what this section, Romans 15, is about. I wonder if you have given to the COVID-19 hardship fund. If not, should you perhaps be doing so? And whether you've given or not yet, can you recommend a needy recipient to David Evans? He'd love to hear from you. Which brings us neatly to David. And I'm going to stop now, and we're going to ask David, possibly with Margaret, I'm not sure, to share some ways in which they have been committed to cross-cultural world mission over the years without even having to leave weekly. Thanks, David.
Great. Thank, thank you for that, Gordon. Um, I'm representing both of us, I think, and, and anything I want to say is very much about what both Margaret and I have been involved in over the years. I'm probably better not count how many years. Um, I, what I want to say as well is to everything I'm going to mention is nothing really exceptional. It's the sort of stuff that numbers of people in our church, in Wheatley Community Church, have been involved in and done, and I suspect done far more faithfully than us. So there's always an awkwardness about being asked to do something like this, that in some way you present as being something super or different. And I really want to emphasize that for everything I'm going to say, then there have been shortcomings, weaknesses, and so on. And others I know uh, have engaged and battled and been involved in very, very similar things. So the first thing I want to say is that through our Christian lives, really, we've been privileged to know several missionaries, people doing work overseas for the Lord and their families, and to be able to support them and that work over many years, over the long haul. And maybe you're uh, sort of new to, to Christian life or maybe later on, but really being able to get to know someone who is working in a, a different context. And actually, it may be a UK context working amongst uh, people of, of diverse backgrounds, or maybe it is an overseas context, has meant to us that we've had far more involvement in the work, far more involvement in prayer than we would have otherwise been able to have. So I just want to give you one little example. And that's a, a, a long-term work that's taken place in uh, a country in, I guess, the Far East, we would call it, where the people we've been supporting have been leading up a team, translating, first of all, the New Testament for a language group who previously didn't even have their language written down, let alone have the, lang the New Testament in their own language. And that was achieved a few years ago. We were able to celebrate with them as that New Testament was, if you like, presented to a whole number of, of churches. And Gordon mentioned earlier on about the gospel, but the gospel not having impact. And sometimes that lack of impact is through misunderstanding, through having to read it and, and learn about it through a second language. And so we've seen there the church really being equipped to be able to make a difference to the gospel. Uh, and we go on praying as they go on working now towards getting the, uh, the Old Testament available. That's just a, one example, actually, we've been privileged to support others as well. And we go on supporting individuals, but being able for us to pray for specific individuals, to know them and their families, and for them to become real family friends to us, and to know their situations in detail, that's been really encouraging and really encouraging to see prayers answered by God in quite remarkable ways. But Gordon also mentioned uh, having a heart that is open to those of other cultures in our own communities here. And I guess I've been privileged through work at Oxford Brooks, but also through our past relationships and currently as well, to be able to uh, live and work uh, amongst people who are from different backgrounds, different cultures, whether they're here for a long time or for, for a, a short time. And getting to know international visitors is actually a huge blessing as well as an opportunity. One of my greatest encouragements in the faith is to meet a Christian from a totally different culture and to find that they speak the same language of faith and that God has worked in them the same hope uh, the, the, the same understanding as we have, and that it truly is a global family that he's calling together from every tongue, tribe, and nation, uh, as the Bible tells us. So spending time with international students and with visitors has given us opportunity to support them as they adapt to our culture, and often they come with expectations of this being a Christian culture, and they're very surprised by what they find is represented as a Christian culture. And also to show them Christian love and to really be able to demonstrate something of the life of Christ and that it really is alive and a reality in the UK. And sometimes that's amongst people who are returning to hostile environments and 
places where they can't speak openly. Gordon's talked about that this morning. And so their time here is really significant. And we believe small things like this are used by God. Now, Wheatley, it may not be such a big scene as that. Some of us will remember a few years ago, a guy called Ricardo, who was with us for a while. It was great to support and encourage Ricardo. There are others that we're meeting through our workplaces, perhaps, perhaps in other ways. Uh, the refugees and Cyril's work there has already been mentioned, but those real opportunities. And just before I go on, I did just want to mention Friends International and those working with international students at the present time. I just wanted to say this is a particularly challenging season. The COVID rules are going to make it very hard. There will be internationals arriving in our communities in Oxford at this time. The previous ways of getting to know them are going to be more challenging. Friends International, which is a, a group that works amongst international student visitors, has done some amazing things over the summer with Zoom, keeping in contact with people, with some online training for the students who will be able to meet those people. But do pray for them as they face a very, very unusual season two. And finally, and I don't want to say much about it, Gordon's already talked about it, is that giving is important too. And working with a mission support group to seek to bless those suffering through the COVID crisis has opened our eyes and our prayers, as we saw this morning with that video uh, from Joe, that is really, really challenging situations. And the knowledge that our church has responded to this has been a huge encouragement and to hear how God uses even small gifts to do big things, again, as we small, saw this morning. It's not the amount of the gift that matters. It's the heart that gives it, and it's how God multiplies it in blessing. And I did just want to say we're coming close to the end of the six months when that fund is, is open, but there is still opportunity to give. And I wonder if you've been moved this morning to give, I would be really delighted if we had some new situations. Perhaps you've held back so far because you don't quite know for sure. Maybe you feel we should give an additional gift to one of the people we've already given to. But if you want to help and think through that, can I say it would be a real blessing for us in the mission support group, but also for the church and obviously for those who receive that gift, if we had maybe one or two more suggestions of places that we might give the, not a huge amount of money, but there is some money still available to give out of that fund. So, so we would love to hear from you. So that gives a little bit of background to us. As I said at the beginning, this I'm sure people in the church who would have the same story and more than that story and could do it much better than I have done. But um, that's probably uh, enough for this morning. I'll, I'll hand back to Gordon. <laughs>